In part one of our consideration of Mill and utilitarianism, we ended by introducing an objection that Mill himself considered, an objection that utilitarianism is a pig's philosophy, and we saw how we, he responded with the idea of quality being an important aspect of pleasure and pain. Here we continue a couple other objections. And so a second objection that Mill himself raises and considers is the concern that utilitarianism devalues the development of virtues and moral character. So the idea here is that we value courage and compassion and self-control and generosity. These are things that are very important in our moral concepts, and yet utilitarianism does away with them by speaking only of increasing pleasure and decreasing pain. So it seems like virtues have no place in his moral theory. Now his response to this objection is that, wait a minute, when we think about virtues more carefully, we realize that nobility of character produces happiness, and it does so in two ways. So, for example, a courageous firefighter who goes in and saves a child from a house that is burning produces happiness, of course, in the child and the parents of the child and other people who know about this. But it also produces happiness in the firefighter, the person who has done her job well because she recognizes that she is of value in the community and that makes her experience happiness and a lack of pain as well. So what Mill says is at the bottom line, sure we talk about virtues, but the reason that virtues are important is because they produce happiness. So it's still happiness that is the most important thing. So we could say that virtue is a part of happiness. Virtue is important for happiness. So a third objection is that sometimes utilitarianism conflicts with justice. And justice often involves producing pain. So when somebody steals a car and gets caught, the person might spend time in jail. Now, putting the person in jail would cause pain to that person and the people who care about that person, who don't want him to be in jail, for example. So when we in invoke justice in our society, it seems to promote pain. And yet justice is an important part of our moral concepts, and we want to have a just society. So this seems to conflict with utilitarianism. Now, Mill responds by saying, yes, sometimes justice promotes some pain, but overall, what is just is what promotes utility. It involves maintaining moral rights, for example, property rights in the case of somebody's car being stolen. It maintains that you ought to treat others as they deserve. So if somebody commits a murder, that person deserves to be punished, and the rest of society, the general people, more people, feel more comfortable with the idea that somebody who commits a crime is going to suffer for it, but not only that, right? More importantly, that their own property, their own life will be protected, and it makes them happier and reduces pain to know that they live in a society that is just. It allows them to make contracts and know that there's a legal system that will require the other person to fulfill their end of the contract. And that allows people to have a more fulfilling life. We want a culture that is just in the sense of showing impartiality and equality, and that again, produces happiness. So when we talk about justice, the things that we talk about are directly related to promoting utility. So again, Mill says, look, we value justice, of course, but the reason is because it promotes utility. It promotes happiness to the greatest number of people possible. And so 
that's the third objection that he responds to and seems to do a fairly good job. Or does he? There is a more challenging way to put this objection. So I'm, I'm going to start a new set of objections. We've had three that Mill himself raised and then responded to. These are objections for utilitarianism that Mill himself didn't deal with, but certainly, of course, contemporary utilitarians are aware of these objections. In any case, it seems like the theory itself leads to very problematic cases of injustice. And so let's just consider a couple examples. These are not original with me. Uh, the first one, Tom, comes from a philosopher, James Rachels, and he talks about this idea that suppose I'm going to change the details, but suppose Tom lives in an apartment complex and <clears throat> he lives in a, in a unit that is open to a courtyard and across the courtyard, a young naive woman moves in and she doesn't close her curtains or blinds and Tom realizes this. So he sets up a video camera to video her in all her daily activities, including getting undressed and dressed and exercising and having visitors over and what have you. And Tom really enjoys watching these videos. Tom is a peeping Tom, right? And so the concern here is that utilitarianism says he's not only permitted to do this, but he's obligated to do what he's doing. Why? because he enjoys it, suppose he feels no guilt about it. Also, let's suppose that unlike most cases today, unfortunately, Tom never shares the videos with anyone else. He doesn't post them on the internet, he doesn't share them, and the woman doesn't know that she is being video. So the woman feels no pain, right? So utilitarianism seems to say, look, this produces pleasure for Tom, no one's getting hurt. This is what he ought to do. Right? He is obligated to do what he's doing. But of course, he's, that's wrong. This is wrong. He is violating the woman. Whether she knows it or not, she's being violated. This is an unjust action. And so utilitarianism is problematic in this way. It says that something is good when we know very well that that thing is bad. One other case that we'll talk about, there are myriads of cases that philosophers have come up with, and uh, some involve trolleys. You can investigate trolley problems and uh, find many of those on the web. But let's talk about Bill. Uh, Bill, this is an example from Nils Rehut, and uh, Bill, suppose, is unliked. Uh, people despise him. Nobody knows him well, he has no parents, he's his only child, he has no siblings, he, he, maybe he was married, but his wife is deceased. Nobody really cares about Bill, and in fact, uh, he's so obnoxious, people wish he weren't around. All right, so imagine Bill uh, one day has appendicitis and uh, goes to a extremely skilled surgeon, he lives in a small town, but there's an amazingly skilled surgeon there and a nurse of anesthetists, and, and they both are utilitarianists, utilitarians, and they both practice it carefully. And of course, we throw in some background ideas that in this small town, there are five wonderful, very loved people who are in great trouble health-wise, Two of them have failing kidneys and they're going to die if they don't get transplants soon. The dialysis is not working for them anymore. Uh, one of them needs a new liver. One needs new lungs. One needs a new heart due to congestive heart failure. And these are people integrated into the town, a mayor, a philanthropist, a, a school teacher, a firefighter, people who have done wonderful things for the town. And if we could just harvest Bill's organs, by the way, of course, he happens to be a perfect match. We could save all five people. Bill has appendicitis. The surgeon says, we'll just put you under, we'll cure you, we'll take out your appendix, everything's going to be fine. He's relieved that he's getting the medical attention. He goes under, he feels no pain, but they harvest his organs, save the people, of course, 
And the town is ecstatic about all of these people now who have recovered. They got the organs they needed. Again, what does utilitarianism say? It says the action was not only good and promoted happiness, right? It was obligatory. That was the best thing to do. That was what promoted the greatest pleasure and reduced Bill's pain. And so this is a great thing to do. But obviously, once again, this is a problematic case of injustice. It is wrong to harvest someone's organs just to save other people. And we know that, right? So this is a problem that utilitarians have to address. One more challenging objection, there are many others. Uh, this is the idea that we value more than the experience of pleasure and avoiding pain. But utilitarianism doesn't account for that. So consider an experience machine. This is something that Robert Nozick, a philosopher, uh, developed this idea. By the way, this was uh, more than 20 years before the Matrix, but what he describes is something like the pods in the matrix, if you've seen that movie, the idea is you go into this machine, you get hooked up into a computer system, and you're wired into it so that it's virtual reality to the max. It seems absolutely real to you, and you have these experiences. So imagine you could do this, and you could go in for five days and have this incredibly wonderful vacation where everything goes right, the weather's perfect, it's just the best time you could imagine, and you could get plugged into this machine. Now, let's extend it out. Imagine that you could get plugged in for an entire lifetime. You could script the way your life should go, you want it to go, and they can plug you in, and that's the way it goes. So if you want to be president of the United States and be loved and have the most popular ratings of any president ever, you know, you could program that. If you want to be a famous actor or celebrity, you can program that. You can be the world's greatest soccer player or basketball player, and you can program that in, and that's the experience you have. If you want to perform at Carnegie Hall and be the greatest pianist ever, you can do that by being plugged into one of these machines. Okay, imagine that. Now, many of you may be saying, Count, count me in, sign me up. Okay, I understand that. But most people, well, maybe not most, at least philosophers, I'll say it that way. Most philosophers say, no, wait a minute. This is problematic. The reason it's problematic is because we want to live. We want to accomplish things. We want to do things. We want to actually be somebody, interact with other people, have contact with reality, actually make a difference in the world. So, well, we may not be president, but we can do things that are good for other people. And instead of just having this pseudo experience of doing these things, isn't it much better to actually maybe get married, have a deep relationship with other people, have uh, things that you do that contribute to society and promote the actual good in reality, right? Rather than just have the experience of pleasure and lacking pain. Now, it seems like utilitarianism says, hey, if we could do this and plug in every human except the few to run the machines, maybe, and by that time, of course, we could automate it all so the AI could do it for us, why not have every human be put in one of these machines? That would be the greatest life for all humans. Of course, we would die off because we wouldn't be reproducing, but hey, everyone would be uh, fulfilled and happy and lack pain, and then probably the world would be better off, according to many, without humans on here anyway, and so that would be the best thing. So you have to ask though, would this be the best thing for humans? To have the vast majority of us, or maybe even all of us, put into experience machines. Is that what is good for our species? Is this the moral 
ultimate moral good for humanity? And the answer seems to be pretty clear to me to be no, absolutely not. This is not the best life that you could live. And so if you think along those lines, clearly there needs to be some other option for what is the foundational moral principles. And that's why we have contrasting moral theories besides utilitarianism.